A warm welcome to you. My name is Jürgen Schonafong and I'm the moderator for this program. And this program has been developed by the Center of Expertise for Creative Innovation and the Media Architecture Biennale. And during this program, which is called How to Design a Sustainable and Inclusive uh, 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 City, of course, uh, we will have a research and look into how art, media, technology, design can be used to build an inclusive and sustainable participatory and metropolitan society. We're going to talk with several architects, with thinkers and designers about their own role in this. It's an open conversation where we show best case scenarios and have and share inspiring visions. In a moment, our first guest will tell us more about his great work as an architect and his vision on the new European Bauhaus. But first, I will tell you a bit more about the Center of Expertise of, for Creative Innovation and their partnership with the new European Bauhaus. The Center of Expertise for Creative Innovation is the creative industry knowledge network that uses art, media, technology and design for a sustainable, inclusive, participatory and metropolitan society. COASI, as we call it, is a collaboration between four knowledge institutes in Amsterdam, and that is the University of Applied Sciences, uh, Amsterdam University of the Arts in Holland and the Gerrit Rietveld Academy. With a lot of expertise in the field of creative industry and artistic research, those uh, those are covered in the institutions. Kwesi has a creative it has creative innovation as its focus, using methods like research through design and critical thinking and making as tools to work on social issues with all relevant stakeholders. And since this year, Kwesi is official partner of the new European Bauhaus, a creative interdisciplinary initiative convening a space of encounter to design future ways of living, situated at the crossroads between art, culture, social inclusion, science and technology. The new European Bauhaus connects to the Green Deal to our living spaces and calls for a collective effort to imagine and build a sustainable and inclusive future. As such, Coesi invites architects, thinkers, designers to elaborate on the needs and good examples that will help us to reach the sustainable ambitions of Europe. And we still have a long way to go in that regard. But no worries, we at this table will create scenarios and look into that future. Upcoming, we have two rounds of table conversations. In the first conversation, we will focus on the architectural processes and the role of the designer to come to a sustainable and inclusive city. Where do we stand now? Where do we need to go? And how can digital tools and platforms help us to realize those goals? In the second table, a conversation will be more focused on the importance of digital tools and methods in the designing process of an sustainable and inclusive city. How can digital design, art and artificial intelligence empower citizens to be involved in city making? What tools are available and how can we best use them to actively engage them with communities and together design, again, a sustainable and inclusive city? But first, I have talked enough, I think, and we can go to our first guest who joins us here at the table. A warm welcome to you, Peter van Assen. And you're the founder of Bureau Slam. Uh, that's an architectural firm dedicated to a circular economy. And next to your work uh, as an architect, you are also the professor Archite uh, architecture and circular thinking at at the Academy of Architecture, part of the University of Amsterdam. A very warm welcome to you. And you will tell us a little bit more about the New Bowers Initiative and circular architectural projects, won't you? That's right, Jürgen. Then I'll say this, uh, this table is yours. <laughs> thank you, Jürgen, and um, I'm very happy to be here and thank you so much for inviting me. Um, so I will talk, I will talk about um, the new Bauhaus the new European Bauhaus. Of course, Bauhaus is an old world, and I, an old word, and I collected it in the theme invent design build. And um, my name is Peter van Assen, uh, Bureausla and Research Group Architecture and Circular Thinking. It is not called circular economy because economy is something I don't know very much about, and also it's always something that is that is a side of you, it's not part of my, it's, it's stuff that economists deal with. So if they solve that problem, then our world will be safe. But I think it's too easy to, to let the future of our world be in the hands of economists. It should be in the hands of designers, obviously. So that's why it's called architecture and circular thinking. We all have to think in along different lines. And I want to start this story, this very brief story, with a little bit of history. And the history is, is about how did we build in the past and 
the role of the architect is an interesting um, is an interesting f phenomenon in this whole story, because architects uh, made the designs of this world, but they also they made all the rubbish of this world because it turns out that every building turns into waste at some point. But it didn't have to be like like that. So in the old days, the architect of the building, as you can see here, is the master carpenter. So the guy, it's always a guy in the, those days who knows the best how to be a carpenter, would e explain the others, okay, guys, this is how we will do it. We go right from here and left from there. So the master builder is the master uh, architect. And at some point in the 15th century, the, this person shows up, Alberti, Alberti. Alberti is a famous Renaissance person, and he does something that, that has never been done before. He is the, uh, the architect of this building we all know in Florence, a beautiful church. Um, so yes, he was a very good architect. But one day, he shows up at the building site, at the building site, imagine all these people are working, and, and he shows up and he does one thing which is very um, revolutionary. He puts on white gloves. He put, puts on white gloves, saying, okay, guys, from this point on, I'm not going to do anything anymore. I'm not going to work. I'm just going to think. And what I think is something that you will make. But me, being the thinker of this whole process, I will not build any more in my life. So that's the start of the page of reason of the Renaissance. And from this moment on, this very, very particular moment, thinking is put above all other ways of dealing with the stuff that we do. And it made all our inventions and it made all our philosophies and it made, of course, a lot. And even, even in, the, in the last century, you can see this is a famous image of urban planners of the Amsterdam's, of the UP, uh, Uitbreidingsplan. They had white laboratory uh, jackets to, to show, okay, I am not some, somebody who's going to, to do anything myself. I am the thinker. I'm in the laboratory and you do the stuff. And this has led to, uh, you could say, the invention of our world, but also to the destruction of our world. Um, because now we are facing a lot of environmental problems, waste problems, and so on. And today you see, and this is of course what the new Bauhaus refers to, today's inventions are also done by doing. So it's not just thinking, it's also doing. And I'll show you two examples because I love these examples. They are a bit, bit older projects, but so this is my daily life and I work with Reiner Pakker and Hester van Dijk, Overtreders Bay. And this is our image to the world. We are young, not so young anymore, professional architects that look like hipsters and act like, uh, <laughs> like f f fancy people. But we have this secret hobby, right? This is our secret life. It's, in, it's after hours, you can see it's dark. Um, and in this hobby, we do things and we invent things. And one of the projects that we did is the pretty plastic plant. So we recycled old household garbage plastic. The story is too long to, to explain how, how and why, but we got a hold of this, these piles of rubbish. And you can see the piles here. They smelled like hell. This was still, this was about, um, uh, you would see, um, baskets of yogurt, but the yogurt would be green because it was rotten and smelly and so on. So we started thinking about what can we do with all this waste and we, we thought oh, what is interesting is to make a facade material, a cladding material, some, some building material that actually you can use, that is a useful purpose. But we didn't know anything about plastics and there are 700 types of plastics and they all have different specifications. It's, it's highly complicated. It's a you need a lot of thinking to go into that world. And we did not do that. We, of course, we had to decide when I use this particular type of plastic, do I die or not? That's the only sort of reason behind it. And some plastics, you do die. So you have to be very careful. But there are also plastics that are very um, healthy to, um, to work with. But nobody wanted to talk to us. The whole industry said, your garbage is not going into my machine because it was spoiled my machine, my machine will break down. So nobody actually wanted to communicate with this, which is interesting because it, it showed us that the gap between um, reinventing new ways of manufacturing and the way it, it, has, it, it has been done until yesterday is huge. So you have to step out of this mode. 
So we, we invented our own machines and we did. Um, and I'll show you a little movie. It's only a, a two minute movie about the, the atmosphere and the way we dealt with this process. This is our masterpiece. The masterpiece is an, is, um, is an extruder, plastic extruder, and we built it ourselves. And we're very proud of it. And of course, we made it look fancy. And we had 1,000 school kids doing workshops with us talking about recycling of plastics. And you would be amazed how many school kids don't even know. If you ask them, what is plastic made of? They would say, potatoes. Mm. Or plastic. Plastic is, of course, made of plastic. Mm. What else? Um, so you have to explain to them that this is, a, uh, this is an oil-based material and it will stop one day. And th this wall was our first wall, our first product that we made. And it made us so happy because what you see here is 100% waste, 100% shampoo bottles, uh, yogurt cups, uh, and so on. Nothing added, nothing else. And if you can make this out of waste, out of 100% waste, there is hope in the future. And then we made these little boots and even the construction is made out of waste, plastic waste um, done. So, so what you see here, except of the metal wires, the screws, the lamp and the girl comes out of the garbage bin. This is a little movie. Do I have to speed up a little bit? I will skip the next slides and go to the last movie and then the new European Bauhaus um, conclusion. You have seen this building here and it was a completely borrowed, 100% borrowed building. So we made this loop in the life of things. So we couldn't, we had to invent new methods of building and it's been shown in a lovely uh, one minute movie here where you see that uh, the building is being erected and no glue, no screws, no sole um, and used and then afterwards, most important, deconstructed. So it's designed for assembly and disassembly. was part of the Dutch Design Week uh, 2017.
so what the, does this mean for the new European Bauhaus? We have to move from Alberti to this way, Gropius. And he did something himself, made a house. And actually there are more projects doing this kind of research by doing and not just by thinking. And one of the ex examples that we do now is the ACT building uh, in the center of Amsterdam, 100% circular thought and built building. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, it was a very quick presentation. There's loads more to say, I know, but 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 we have, will have more time later on, uh, possibly to address those topics. Uh, the new European Bauhaus. Uh, it's interesting because it's it's about new ways of, of envisioning Europe and involving the Green Deal as well. Um, but Bauhaus itself, as a concept, has been very criticised. I, I heard a lot of critique to use that name because Bauhaus itself doesn't stand for inclusion or doesn't stand for 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 the, the the diversity what is your reaction to that yeah it's absolutely right so so the the inclusion was was very to our perspective very 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 limited so women had a had a very particular role in this in this whole education system but you have to imagine that that women in those days meant nothing at all in the professional sense so um they made this house on Horn, for example, and they did something spectacular there. They gave the man and the woman a separate bedroom. So they would not sleep together to indicate that the, that the woman had a right to have a life of her own. And of course, nowadays you would say, okay, this, what does it mean? And, and did it actually evolve into something else? I think it's a very, very small first step 100 years ago in what we have achieved now and still have to achieve in the next century probably. Right, and fortunately visions have changed and about those changing visions we're talking today. Uh, this is the first conversation that we have and that we will focus on the architectural pro process and the role of designers to come to sustainable and inclusive cities. And I've, uh, we've invited some guests to join us in the conversation. Uh, virtually here through Zoom is uh, Marta Male Alemani. A very warm welcome to you. I will introduce who you are. You're a doctor in architecture and researcher specialized in a religious relationship and integration between design and digital production technologies. And currently, you're also a head lecturer in digital production at the Faculty of Technology, part of the Amsterdam University of Applied Scientists. A very warm welcome to you. My first Thank you question, for <laughs> of course, we're happy, very happy to have you. And uh, I, I don't know whether I can, I can share it, but when Peter saw that you were here, uh, he said, well, she's world famous. So, you know, your reputation has preceded you. So we're very happy that you're here at the moment. Um, I will go to you in a minute. But first, I would like to introduce our other guest. And that is Jeroen Boomgaard. A very warm welcome to you as well. You're an art historian and art prof and professor art and public space at the Gerrit Rietveld Academy. And you're also so uh, head of the Master Artistic Research at the University of Amsterdam. No you stopped. Why? And when did that happen? And they why is my me. They pensioned you. Oh, Shit they happens. are ungrateful. Let's say that. Shit yeah. <laughs> well, a very warm welcome to you, Marta. Can I start with you? Can I start first with a question? What is your reaction to the examples or best case scenarios that Peter shared with us? And then I'm very interested if you could tell us more about the Robot Studio and what you do there. But first, the reaction to Peter's story. What is that? Well, I, I love Peter's story and I have a funny reaction because many of those plastic tiles are actually in my lab. Mm. So uh, it's, um, it's very funny because they are at the Faculty of Technology. When I arrived at the Javier, uh, the project uh, had just happened, uh, part of these plastic tiles. So I'm super happy. All of a sudden I kind of have a connection to those. Uh, to those tiles, and I hope that we can give them yet another future uh, round uh, with a maybe more complex kind of structure uh, holding them in space. So Great. I, hope that, I hope that we can do this together. Anyway, um, super interesting for sure. Uh, the connection to thinking versus doing is a very critical one. Uh, for me, uh, I, I do not conceive thinking without doing. Uh, that's, um, I think that all the architects like me that started with digital production a long time ago, 
um, we were very much concerned with making uh, tangible steps uh, to bring uh, the more kind of abstract designs that we were developing through computational design into the world. And uh, at that moment, well, it was very obvious that we needed to do a lot of doing in order to uh, to do that because we were transferring technologies that were that belonged to a completely different field than architecture from automotive industry from aerospace and so on so um, it's been 20 years of uh, almost research by doing uh, if i may say um, and and now we are very much in a place where we can integrate the two so i i really really um, value the explanation of peter Thank Great. you. And, and um, Robot Studio, can you tell us a little bit more about that? What do you do there? What's the aim? Well, the Robot Studio, first of all, was born precisely between uh, to give shape to this relationship between thinking and doing. Because when I moved into the uh, Javier, there was then the wish to connect, connect as a bridge between research and education. And uh, in my view, uh, these two things cannot be connected. They need to be integrated. They need to happen simultaneously. So the robot studio uh, was born a little bit with this idea to have a place, to have a, a lab per se, a kind of physical space where we would be able to do research and education at the same time. So there uh, we basically um, decided to uh, implement robotic technologies for production uh, to, because uh, Robots, we understood, were the more versatile, the potentially most versatile digital production machines because we would be able to invent what they would do depending on the end effector or depending on the process that the robots were making and uh, that we would be able to experiment with various materials and that it would be kind of a creative space to use this technology, not only, uh, well, to investigate new forms of making, but most importantly, to bridge to the industry and to be able to upscale into the industry because that was essential for us. So that's what we do at the Robot Studio. We, we are a creative slash engineering uh, specialized team with ve very different disciplines. And uh, we are developing processes at the Robot Studio that we aim to be able to upscale and implement uh, so that we can create a real impact. Yeah, thank you. And and when we talked before, you said uh, the objects that you create embody the principles of the new Bauhaus, a uh, new European Bauhaus. In what way do they do that? Well, they do that in very simple terms. I think uh, when when I say they embody, is because uh, on the one hand they embody uh, technology because they they are uh, designed with computational design. They are produced. Uh, with advanced production uh, methods like in robotic production and, and so on. And uh, they are made of circular materials. Uh, they are thought uh, with the KPIs to do uh, to, to have an impact. The, the designs and the, and the KPIs of impact KPIs are trying to be aligned. So there is a whole uh, set of um, how to say, uh, interests and missions that are embedded in those objects. Mm. Uh, about the impact, I wanted to know a little bit more later on, but thank you for now. But first, I would like to introduce our next guest, Jeroen. Can you tell us a little bit more about the work that you do? Well, I'm a, I'm a stinker, so I am on distance. Um, but at the same time, I work at Rietveld Academy with, uh, with makers, re makers researchers. And um, I, I really like what Peter was saying about, you know, the new role of, um, pres I would call it presence in society. Right? So, and, and maybe that is a bit, you know, at, at, in discussion with the notion of the digital, I think the physical presence is a really important element, that the element of making, but also the element of being there. And I work with makers researchers. Um, the terrain is partly design, but also, a lot of them are artists working in public space. And as you know, of course, works of art do less have a direct function, but they also have this element of promising another future. Mm -hmm. And this future can be quite near or it can be further away. But there's always this element of very physical presence, even if it's not an object, but it's an artist doing something, it's embodied presence, mm -hmm. which I think is, is very important in creating relations between people in society. But it is also very much about um, 
creating the possibility of imagination or of potential of oh yes there's something else mm -hmm. and uh, we uh, I, I simply work with makers artists that start realizing that communicating about what they're doing might help them get further you know if a, a lot of a lot of artwork and probably also architectural work is project based mm. you work towards something in terms of research the, the trajectory is longer you you develop experiments experiments and you don't know where you're going and so that and, and you have to communicate about that to understand what you're doing now in relation to the new european bauhaus i find it a pity that they didn't take another example at the same time as bauhaus there was an uh, uh, what do you mean by another example? An I'm going to tell you. Right. At the same time as the Bauhaus, there were uh, schools in uh, then Soviet Union, art schools, that had a two-year foundational year in which the students experimented with all forms of arts and crafts. And architecture was not of the top, uh, the top of the pyramid. It was, you know, it was also working with clay, with you know, sculpture, with painting, etc. And it, it included a lot of female artists, so it was much more leveled. And, and the interesting thing was that, of course, the same as Bauhaus, it was about designing daily life. But in, in Russia, or the Soviet Union, it was also designing revolution, revolutionary life. And the, uh, the examples that you get from those schools, which of course only existed for a couple of years because after 27 everything was closed down, are amazing. Mm. The, the energy of trying to find out what daily life can look like without knowing if it's really going to happen mm, right. was quite good. Peter, what's your reaction to that? It shouldn't be the new European Bauhaus, but a new European-Russian right. school system. <laughs> it, sounds <laughs> <a> idea. <laughs> it sounds amazing to me, so I, I, would, I would love to see these examples. Uh, and yes, so interesting about Bauhaus was that, that they also had a lot of form studies and yeah. color studies sure. and they, they touched every material. And then architecture, so does Bauen would be in the middle yeah. of this of the, the circle, but, but actually nobody ever did it really, no. right? No. Only a few. Um, so, so in the end, it stayed in the circle of uh, forms and colors and inventing mostly new new tools, uh, new yeah. lamps and, and, and mm. so on, and tableware and, and so forth. So um, aesthetics is also a very important part of designing. Well, so the, the new the new Bauhaus should be is not about economy, is not about the environment. It's about finding a new vocabulary or a new expression of how we how we how we make things, how mm -hmm. we make how we sh how we shape our our environment. Yeah. So, and in in that sense, I I, I wonder as well, uh, Marta. Um, you talked about impact and impact models as well. If we talk, we're here we talked a little bit about aesthetics. Is there are there any impact models for aesthetics in an urban environment? Well, the thing is that I just a little bit disagree with what Peter uh, said because, I, at least from my perspective, the new European Bauhaus is really putting the accent on sustainability. Mm. Uh, and therefore, the environment is uh, essential. And uh, and so there is a. I, as far as I understand, it is wanting to create a language, but also address that this language somehow is uh, em embodies uh, what it is to address the, the climate crisis and therefore sustainability as such. So it is it is not it cannot be almost not separated. So in in our case, uh, I was speaking about impact. And maybe I can I can explain it more with when you see a visual example of what I mean mm. uh, from the work that I have here to present you, um, because you will see there is a design that you can, the design of a reception desk. I put it as an example. Uh, you can you can agree or disagree whether it's beautiful or not beautiful, but what what matters to us is that the. There is an aesthetic concept, of, of course. Uh, it is the result of, des of computational design and robotic production. But most importantly, it is connected to the impact we want to make by, by reusing residual wood, by uh, doing a kind of, um, let's say, um, a kind of design 
a system that actually can be assembled on site, transported compact, et cetera. So there is many uh, design principles uh, that are circular circular thinking, as Peter described before, that are part of this design. Right. So, and how do they balance off each other? I mean, how important is a circularity uh, in regard to, to aesthetics? Um, how, how, how do they bounce off each other? And as students or as artists, how do you deal with that um, um, juxtapose almost? And can I can I show the example? Of course you can. Yeah, that, yeah. That that would be the best and most yeah. simple way of of uh, um, of doing Show it. Show us. We're curious. Yes, you have the slides. Okay, here we go. Yeah. So well, this was a kind of introduction about uh, the robot studio, what we do in Amsterdam Circular. I will lift my hand to whoever is putting the yeah. slides. So we're we're looking for a desk, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. So if you if you move forward, uh, this is the kind of work that we do, uh, working with residual wood, uh, some conversations piece we did in the in the past. And here we go. Here we go. This is a, a pile of residual wood. We we basically use 3D scanning technologies to create a database of all the material that we have available. We are able to also with a camera detect the color of the wood that we're going to be using and then connect this with our uh, parametric design process where here we are not only uh, designing, let's say a flexible model that can adjust to the material we have available. We can also on the basis of that database populate the model and create the most optimal position for every piece of wood that we have in this model. So um, here we have created a series of sorting algorithms to sort the wood in this model, lighter wood at the bottom, darker wood at the top, shorter pieces in the end, longer pieces in the middle, so that the result of what you see here is actually not only just thinking and just designing and then producing, but it's actually integrating material production process and design, so all in ones. So uh, here you see the system of this uh, desk is a series of interlocking pieces. Everyone is custom made with uh, specific joints with the assembly sequence so that it can be transported uh, on site in a compact way. There is no glue, no screws. All the pieces come together so that they can be eventually disassembled. You see us here at the robot studio uh, prototyping all of these and of course learning by doing and here is where the do is important and uh, well the students are being trained at the same time that we are doing research so it's the integration of research and, and education and here is the desk so here we are we look at the final desk we have 300 plus pieces of residual wood that were meant to be burned. This is hardwood, beautiful hardwood that would, if it did not become this desk, would have just been burned. So mm. we are, we are uh, here is, a, in my opinion, is an object that embodies the principles of the European Bauhaus because it connects technology, it connects uh, design and aesthetics, and it connects sustainability and impact. And if you, it's a beautiful example, and the desk is beautiful as well. Uh, you also talked about scale-ups. Is this a principle that can be scaled up, or is this one of a kind, a unique piece? How can you apply the scale-up? Beautiful question. Thank you very much for asking this, because we are now exactly, we see this as the seed of our future projects. We are now concerned with upscaling this, because eventually, if you thought about the production of, say, 20 desks like this one, every one of those desks would be different from another one, because to begin with, the database of material would have been different. So uh, we are creating a kind of design system, a generative design system on the basis of the wood that becomes available. So if you would think about this as a smart production line uh, or a smart product design and production system, you could say, then as wood would become available and you can never anticipate what kind of wood you will have available because you're not working with standard materials, you're working with residual materials, then you have to necessarily have a very flexible design system and computational design system that is linked to 
to actually robotic production that can be automated in order to generate a variability of, of desks like this. Great. Um, Jeroen, can I go to you? Uh, this is a beautiful example how uh, different ideals can, can inter interconnect with each other and intersectional thinking. Sure. Um, that's also what you stimulate at your, to, to, for your students to think that way as well. Sure. But if you have that intersectional thinking and if you connect that to diversity, is this and these principles, are they not only accessible for a small part of society? Are they not to... The, the criticism about secularity is that it's very exclusive and it's not accessible for everybody. What's your vision on that? I think, you know, at, at an art school you can see that, that uh, diversity is, is still difficult uh, because there's so many cultural dif differences. Art has long had the stigma of being elitist, etc. I think it takes time. Um, and I think as, as long as you start touching on matters of concern, as, as you are doing with this, and as long as there's this notion of impact and you question yourself, what kind of impact is it that I want? Mm. And for instance, at Rietveld, I see students much more busy with these notions now than they were like 10 years before. And also students are much more protesting and, and thinking about diversity, inclusivity, etc. So um, I think culture is changing and, and you cannot expect one European Bauhaus to change everything at the same time. It will go slowly, but I think we are going in the direction, for yeah. sure. And, and uh, it's, of course, a very important goal. And, and Peter, um, what I also wonder is, um, are we willing to, to convince the majority of the inhabitants of Europe to think in this way? I mean, the Swedish shop, uh, you know, which is worldwide, IKEA, is, not of course, very popular because it's very affordable, it's very cheap. And we, we like the design. It, it's OK. We don't have the unique design. So that new ways of thinking, how that... How can that spill over to a broader public? Ooh, um, so can, are people willing to... I'm not sure if people are willing to or not, but there is this necessity. We have to change, otherwise we will destroy the way we live. So, so the question might not be so pressing now, but it will be in a few years. What you see here, what I really loved about the example that Martha is giving us is that this is that this is not a technical solution so we don't need a technical solution mm. to solve the environmental problem mm. we need we need a new culture of thinking a culture of doing a culture of making and this uh, culture is of course what is the new Bauhaus or the new Russian revolution <laughs> as you points out is all about it, it is a revolution so in that sure. sense it yeah, would no, be it true. would match yeah, sure. uh, and it's a revolution of of the broader thing, it's not a technical mm. thing. Right. There are a couple of questions from the audience that I would like to ask, and the first one is directed to Marta. Um, Joe says, the reception desk appears not to, be, to, not to embody inclusive design, though, as it doesn't appear to enable access for disabled people who use wheelchairs, for example. Again, it's a matter of inclusivity. What is your reaction to that? Well, the, let's say behind, the, the desk is just a normal desk. And, and actually with our parametric design process, we could make it lower, wider, shorter, and so on. So it, it's, the inclusivity is embedded in the parametric design from the, if you think about inclusivity with disabled people, for sure it is included in the parametric design process. That's one. Um, if you think about, for instance, the inclusivity as in, uh, could people co-design the desk? Uh, could we make the design not something we do, but something we do together with other people? Then also there, parametric design could be a, a tool for uh, including uh, people that are normally excluded from the design process mm. and, uh, and so on and so on. So I think that uh, there is many levels of inclusivity, including the fact that we might uh, make this process, who knows, in the, in the, in the near future, open source and therefore be another level of inclusivity. So there is, I think there is many, many different levels of inclusivity in Great. the desk. Thank you for that answer. Uh, we've reached the, almost, the, almost the final stage of this conversation. The final question is from Ian and he asks, recycling can be conducted within such limited spaces as garages or studios. So it can be applied with the example that, that you showed us. Um, it can be applied everywhere by everybody or can it? 
No, it cannot. Ah. So, so yes, yes. So the world, the, the we need to show uh, that is possible. So you need to make impact, uh, and the impact is only done by actually showing, okay, guys, it can be done. It mm. can be done. So f for that, you need the barn, the garage, and the shed. Yes, but of course, it it has to scale up. So if you cannot scale up and we did with this tile. So now we are uh, taking away 4,000 kilos every month of waste out of the garbage and to make these new tiles. 4,000. That's not being done in a garage. Mm. You need you need an actual big plan for that. So the first step, yes, but as soon as you can, second step, scale up and make it uh, happen. Scale up and make it happen, but the ideas have to start in the sheds and the garages. Exactly. Well, thank you so much, Jeroen, Marta and Peter. Peter, we'll see you at the pro end of the program. Well, this has been the first round of the conversation. We'll, we'll have a table shift here, uh, and then we'll start with our second conversation. And I believe we've got a bumper in between. And we're back. This second round of conversation, we will talk about the, the, the importance of digital tools and methods in the design project, uh, design process of uh, an, a sustainable and inclusive city. And here at the table, I'm joined by uh, Martijn Paul, Kwan Supaibunsuk, and Gabriele Ferry. A warm welcome to you all. I will introduce you all. Martijn, you're an architectural entrepreneur in positive impact for urban developments and a founding partner of Space Matters. And Martijn is also responsible for the emergence of multiple new business ventures, which I'm very curious about. So hopefully we'll, you will tell us more about that. Uh, Kwan, a very welcome to, a warm welcome to you. You're a software, design, a software engineer with a multidisciplinary background working at the Digital Society School. And you're, you also tinker with emerging technology and develops various digital tools. Yes. No, I'm, I'm in that tinkering, I'm, uh, I want to know about that. Uh, you're always questioning the roles of which, uh, which technology plays in our society and how we can be get better designs and, and design them to uh, argument reality. Very good. And our final guest, but not the least, of course, is Gabriele Ferri. You work at the crossroads of design research, education, and cr the creation of experimental ways to engage people from all walks in life in imagining together how their neighborhood might be different. Uh, you currently are a senior researcher at the Lecturate Civic Interaction Design at the Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences and head of program at the Master Digital Design. Before you warm welcome to you, to start with you first, that um, uh, creation of uh, experimental ways to engage mm -hmm. people, I think that's very important to create an inclusive city. Can you tell us, us a little bit about, uh, uh, about your methods? Yeah, look, uh, I am uh, really excited and happy to be here and I'm a little bit uh, not so much at ease because I come right after uh, such uh, a super nice uh, panel of architects and actually I make games. I make games for engaging people in how to imagine different, uh, different neighborhoods. So what I do is to try and create strange artifacts, uh, like I think we, I, we are seeing uh, a few of them in the slideshows. Some are my projects, some are projects from people that I admire. Uh, and the idea is that I like to put this out of 
place objects in mm. public spaces uh, as a way to trigger uh, discussion and to trigger uh, conversation between people. Because I think that is absolutely fundamental, that is not only uh, you know, the usual suspect that are normally uh, uh, straight, white, educated men that imagine how do we, uh, uh, how will the future of the city be like, but I really believe that we should include everybody from really all walks of life, uh, minority, people with uh, lower income, lower education, uh, people from all sorts of different backgrounds, uh, and we need to bring them in in imagining how the city So be. far, everybody agrees with you, yes. but the question is not why or why should mm -hmm. we do it, because everybody wants mm -hmm. to do it. The real matter is how. So yeah. how do you do that? Look at that. Uh, that's, I will look. That's, a really, that, that's the, ugly, the world's <laughs> ugliest robot. Uh, we uh, <laughs> created that and we put it in a, in a public <laughs> library and we pretended that it came from the future uh, to learn about how do we imagine uh, mm -hmm. the future of libraries. Um, it stayed in a public library in the States uh, a few years ago uh, for, uh, for a few weeks uh, and a lot of people interacted with that, uh, told its stories, uh, chatted with it. Of course, the <laughs> robot uh, was somehow fake because there was somebody behind that uh, pretending to be the robot, uh, but it was really a way to engage people and to ask questions uh, to people that would not normally take part in mm. such a research. So is this kind of playful interaction between the artifact and people that gather uh, But how important is the location? Because you go to the library, mm -hmm. that in itself is also a selection of people of the city, of and then you've got the robot there, mm -hmm. which is associated with mm -hmm. technology, even though somebody's mm -hmm. got a computer there, yeah. that also selects a certain group of people who are interested or who are comfortable to engage with the robot. Very um, cool. What do you... What do you, how do you think about these selection methods? Very true. I, everything is contextual, of course. There are other projects. I think that there is another one in the slideshow. There are other projects, not by me in this case, uh, that I really like because, uh, yeah, that, this one. Um, this is something that uses a payphone. Uh, mm -hmm. I've discovered recently that I have a big fascination with public phones exactly for the reason that, uh, that, that you were saying. These are things that do not select necessarily their users. These are things that are uh, made to be in public spaces, uh, and these are things that when they ring, uh, people tend to answer. <laughs> Pick it up. <laughs> Right, and then, then it's, it's accessible for everybody. Exactly. Right. Uh, Martijn, um, uh, you, heard, you, you, were wit you witnessed our first conversation. What's your reaction to, to the, the topics that were mentioned before? Yeah. <clears throat> well, as said by, uh, by Peter, um, as a circular thinker, I think we are system thinkers, mm -hmm. uh, which, of course, relate to circularity, uh, from linearity to circularity. And in our practice at Space and Matter, which is by heart an architectural practice, and so we think about the visual appearance of stuff, like the hardware, but actually the name says it, and that's the spatial part. What we like much more and where we spend much more energy on is actually the matter. What drives these processes? What's the systems behind it that eventually emerge into spatial constellations? Mm. Um, and project examples, I have some uh, projects in the slideshow, maybe I can briefly introduce just later. Yep. But reflecting on, uh, on the previous speakers and the circular thinking and the system thinking, I think that's very fundamental and maybe relating to the Green Deal discussion. Uh, it's not about uh, the, a change of appearance, it's about building a movement or a paradigm shift. And I think the paradigm shift needs to rely on alternative systems mm. because the systems but how we're can in you right now... Uh, it's, not, it's, yeah. it's, it's difficult to create new systems, but it's also difficult to implement those systems in, within society. Yeah. That We saw that with the corona crisis. We, mm. At the beginning, one and a half years ago, we all thought this is going to be happening. There is a systemic change going to happen. Yeah. Hopefully we're now at the end and that systemic change hasn't happened yet. So small how steps, do you, yeah. how do you, small steps you mm -hmm. say, uh, how much time will it take to change the system and will we be in time? Well, that's a big question. Um, for me, rather sooner than later, and I think for society, everybody understands the urgency that we need to like replace the current system with a Does everybody? system. I, I do question whether everybody well, understands okay, that. Okay, okay. Maybe not everybody. Of course, I'm in a bubble and everybody in my bubble agrees. Um, maybe the masses might disagree, but I think if we consider 
biodiversity collapse, housing crisis, the big divide in the haves and the not haves, like moving forward, this will only uh, get worse. Mm. So I do believe that everybody sh will some point agree that biodiversity collapse is not something we're uh, happy with. Same as for the housing crisis and the big divide. Mm. So society-wide, I think we need to reconsider the systems, and that's mainly driven by the capitalist uh, system, and, and, and I'm talking systems and drivers. So how can we replace this uh, with small experiments outside of this system and actually develop prototypes, test them, which is alternative mm -hmm. ownership, alternative financial models, mm -hmm. or alternative decision-making and mandates in the organizations mm -hmm. that provide hopeful perspectives and on a very small scale we do implement these hopeful perspectives mm. have you got examples of systems that you've changed the projects that you worked on mm. that are exemplary for well, that okay, system then, change then it's the time for the examples we have developed um, the keuvel as a affordable sp or um, a space that provides affordable uh, space for artists to work where actually it's founded on polluted soil that's has a negative land value because in order to do something with that soil, you need to clean it and mm. then you need to spend money on it, et cetera, et cetera. We, we said, well, for us, it's no problem. If it's polluted soil, we'll make a vegetation plan and the vegetation slowly, but certainly, and because there's no rush, if you're in a rush, you need to spend money. If you don't, you spend time. Mm. So in this case, the plants do the cleaning. We got the land for free. We collected 14 houseboats. We put them on the land, so mm. free land, free boats, our time and a little bit of pocket money and a strong community backing us up. That's yeah. what made this beautiful project happen. And in this project, we are now testing uh, smart grids for the energy production and consumption to be shared equally within the community. We do small-scale food production. We are entirely off the grid, decentralized yeah. And it's sanitation. very successful in that sense. And we, we, yeah. we talked about scaling up. Is, it, is this the principle <coughs> of the COVID that started... Five years ago, something like that. Uh, it's in place seven years seven. now. Uh, can it can it be scaled up? Uh, stuff we've tested has been implemented in the Schoon Schip project, which is slightly more mm -hmm. formalized, you might say, and not that the Keuvel is not formalized, but it's alternatively uh, formalized by structures. Mm -hmm. Schoon Schip is a, a 46 household floating community, yeah. also based on uh, energy production consumption divided within the community. It's off the grid from the perspective of sewage. It's developed by the people themselves. There's alternative finance. So everything you mention is alternative and like almost 180 degrees different from what you would have expected if society would have supplied this. Yeah. Yeah. But yet it's just 46 households. But the model works, the principles work, and actually the system behind it, where do I have a system scheme? Um, and the, the testing and implementation of these systems have been proven, and this is scaleless. It's proven to right. be in function we, for we 46. To, we, we and in the next it up couple to of years, 460, 4,000. Yeah, 60. exactly. That's yeah. the question because uh, we have to build a million houses. At least that's yeah. what the government thinks in order to solve the uh, housing crisis. Yeah. Is this a system that can be applied to those million houses as well? Uh, if you ask me, uh, definitely yes. <laughs> because I believe <laughs> is that in the dream, in or is that reality? <laughs> Uh, it should be reality very soon because mm. I'm making uh, inclusive, self-sufficient systems, well, that's actually the Kate Rayworth and the donut model. Mm. There is only one planet. The way we deal with resources, we need, I don't know, three and a half planets, two and a half planets. So the extractive model doesn't work. We're uh, putting ourselves to extinction. Yeah. So we have to make small-scale satellite projects that take care of themselves, sustain themselves, are catered and cared for by themselves. Yeah. And if you see the city as a rich collection of small self-supportive satellites, mm. I think that's where we reach a balance with biodiversity, equality and inclusivity. Right. But that's still one generation ahead of us. We still have to do some work. Yep. Uh, Kwan, you're a system thinker as well. Can you tell us a little bit about your projects, the project that you worked on, where system thinking and system changing were applied? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you know, there's one project that I worked on a few years back, Yeah, right there on the slide. Um, uh, we consulted with a, com a startup in Belgium, mm -hmm. uh, in Antwerp, and they want they had this vision where they wanted to take cars off the off the streets and into parking lots. And yeah, when we looked at this, there was a lot of systems um, in terms of their vision because they want to provide mobility as a service. Mm -hmm. um, and overall, it, the goal here isn't only about mobility, but it's just a way of living because um, how people live uh, it affects 
it affects, yeah, how the waste management system, um, how much energy they use. Um, yeah, so we had to look at all these different uh, systems that are involved here and, yeah, kind of design and see where where people are interested there. And, and that, that tinkering with emerging technology, how, how do you apply that in, 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 the, in the projects that you work on? Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of a lot of that has to do with uh, just innovation mapping, uh, mm -hmm. trying to see which technology would fit. Um, and a lot of what I do now is uh, tinkering, playing with different technologies, kind of asking like how uh, how does it apply to society, how does it affect society. So not this slide, but I think the next slide. Um, yeah, uh, we're at Digital Society School. We just ran an experiment where we played with some digital twins, and we asked the question, oh, how does that affect um, the sense of connection. Um, so actually this, this is probably like an interesting question for architects in the future as well, because yeah, what happens when architecture is no longer just phys physically spaced, but also digitally sp spaced? How mm. does that work um, in hybrid? How can that work? Can you, can you give an example of that? Mm -hmm. um, in terms, well, in terms of coming from uh, the design perspective, uh, having digital and physical comes well together because having the digital space, the digital twin is a digital copy of the physical space mm -hmm. and that allows you to simulate. So instead of um, having one version of something, you can uh, create multiple versions and then you can simulate to see how, how everything runs together. Um, say if you have um, uh, a uh, production system, production line, mm -hmm. you can put all the robots um, in a simulated space and you can kind of try to run and see what uh, um, what setup works best? What is an optimal setup so that you reduce the amount of waste and the mm. amount of uh, time in which people move throughout the space? Mm. And can we, as regular humans, uh, is it will it be of use for us as well? Um, I think for regular citizens, um, I think it can be in terms of imagination, imagining imagining what is possible. Um, and yeah, imagining a world that uh, where we live more hybridly and live with technology, mm -hmm. in which technology isn't really taking over our lives, but we're living in a way where it's well balanced together. Yeah, because that well balancing is something that you mentioned before as well, because a city is made up of different systems that are interconnected. Um, how can we improve that connection of cis different kinds of systems? I think it comes down a lot to intent of the systems because um, when you design systems, you usually have some intention intention in mind what uh, what you want that system to achieve. Mm. Um, and when you look at it at different systems on different scales, how do those intentions combine? Um, and sometimes they clash, and you have to make that choice on which uh, which value is more important mm. um, and which value as a community do we want um, to take forward. And what, what values are those? Um, yeah, I mean, we're talking about uh, sustainability <laughs> and inclusivity. Um, those are definitely two, two important ones. Um, and talking about inclusivity, that's, uh, that's a part that also determines the values because um, as a community, you determine values together and it's not just one person saying, hey, I value this, but it's a bit of a compromise. Okay, yeah. These are important values. These are shared values in our community, and mm -hmm. we're gonna build this together. Right, and then yes, the, the, what we said with Gabriel as well. Then you have to hear everybody's voice, and everybody needs to have a seat at the table. Uh, Gabriel, to go to you as well, because you, you before the program as well, you said it's not only a matter of finding the most appropriate path to achieve sustainability, but also imagining and sharing a vision of the future that makes sense for everyone. Mm -hmm. How do you develop a vision of the future? Because my vision is probably completely different than yours. Well, look, I want to connect to what Juan was saying mm. before. Uh, you, you were talking about the digital twin, and I would love to be to play to, and to make people play with mm. the digital twin. And to go back to your question, I think that to develop a vision of the future that makes sense for everybody, we need to allow people to experiment and to tinker with a representation of what the future could be. Therefore, the connection with the digital uh, with the digital twin. Uh, you need to make it tangible, probably. Uh, so uh, here on the screen, I have a game with little robots uh, that pretend to be somehow introverted. And that was an explanation of uh, how somebody who is introverted uh, experience our urban space. 
and we need to make it public. We mm -hmm. need to invite people in. So, in my opinion, this is these are the the, the, the component yeah. for the, to answer that question. If you invite people in, if you if you have all these shared voices that that you mm -hmm. heard, and then you create a vision, how can you make sure that? government either local or national will take those voices seriously because they 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 have the trust put in people that they reckon to be educated to have the right diplomas how do you make sure that it doesn't trickle down but trickles trickles up you really need to be the advocate of the people that play with your systems mm. uh, i think that designers this day have a duty to uh, be an interface between the have not and the mm. and the have uh, so it's not necessarily much about only about designing something that is beautiful, that is functional, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also about capturing the wishes and desires of the people that do not have a voice mm -hmm. uh, and boost that voice uh, to the governments and to the powers that be. But and is that realistic? Because designers are being educated now to be autonomous, almost artists in a sense, but create their own vision. And it's... It's oftentimes the, the case that they design what people want or what they think that people want. If we talked about system change, that systemic change in our, in our minds, that designers should be more you know, functional in that sense to what people want. Is that realistic? Well, to connect to the other two speakers, I think designers project ideas or take future perspectives to today's imagination and I translate my imagination and mm -hmm. check in with you or validate. But what's interesting about games, games are low threshold, easy access and behavioral experiments and combined with simulation. So what I consider the system and an alternative reality could be tested in a simula simulated environment through the rules of the game mm -hmm. and then find out if it affects your behavior positively or negatively because in the system that I again propose, talking about systems it's yeah. the other way around again you decide what you or what you think is good then you test it with the audience where gabriella says something completely different he says listen to what the people want and take that into your design so that's the other but, way but around I, I do believe in order to find out what we think people want or to actually ask the people what they think they want you need to test them in a game simulated environment mm -hmm. because i think if you ask what people want you don't get the right answer but that sounds maybe arrogant already mm -hmm. so you have to put them in a different uh, comfort zone or you have to take them out of their comfort zone put them in a different setting in a behavioral setting yeah. where they actually experience in real life questioning their own questions or potential answers mm -hmm. And then reframe to, ah, okay, this is what I actually want. Gabriela, I, I want to I check with you again. Do not people not know experiment. what they want if you ask them what they want? Well, look, uh, Steve Jobs, with whom I disagree completely, but Steve Jobs you, uh, famously said that panels and, you know, kind of the, that kind of user testing were always wrong because people tend to say, consumers tend to say that they want something cheaper and uh, uh, faster. Mm. Um, I think that the role of a designer is to present a blank slate of a certain kind mm. and allow people to experiment in a way that makes sense. Emphasizing three times in a way that makes sense. Mm. Uh, and I think that my colleagues here uh, are on the right track because we need a simulation of what reality mm -hmm. is and we need a vision of a, some kind of a vision of where do we go in the future. But then you really need to be very humble in leaving a lot of white canvas to, to color in mm. uh, because ultimately it's the people that we serve. I see, Kwan, that you agree with that. The white canvas, is that something that a designer should do or is it something that designers are able to do? I think, um, yeah, to add on to what Gabrielle said is also, um, yeah, you need um, a play space and you need a vision, mm. um, but you also need to remain in this reality where you're looking at, um, yeah, what's happening in the world today and mm. where does it seem like it's going? What are the trends? Because mm -hmm. um, I think an important thing we need to keep in mind is uh, we're building a city and it's, is it for the people today or the people of tomorrow? And so that, that's mm. why we also need to take a look at where is this really going um, and remain in that. But Gabriel says, states it's, it's for the people in, in our future, um, which I find very challenging because I don't think that our grandfathers or grandmothers could imagine the way we live now, actually, and that we're here uh, talking with, with, with people around the globe through a screen. I mean... 
things happen very quickly and life changes a lot. How can you develop for the future? Mm-hmm. You got to adapt. <laughs> <laughs> iterative processes. Um, and what do you mean by iterative thinking. processes? Um, yeah, doing short, short uh, experiments, doing a lot of prototypes and um, trying not with just uh, um, the same group of people, but different groups of people and mm-hmm. then doing that continuously because, yeah, people change over time. So yeah. how do you um, keep building to... Um, accommodate for that, change. and that means flexibility as well. Yeah, and um, um, if you if you if you talk about the role that a designer has, Gabriel n- mentioned it, it, he should be an inter or he or she should be an interface. The designer should be an interface. So that is, you know, c- c- involving everything, considering everything, bringing that together and design something new from that. Is that a, a vision that you agree on as well? Um. Hmm. I think that Ooh. silence says it all. <laughs> <laughs> to, to a certain extent, I would say yes. Um, I think, uh, yeah, designers have the power in which they say what do they make visible and what do they make invisible. Because, mm-hmm. um, and that's that's. Uh, I feel like that's where a lot of the problems lie. Like where where they choose to make things visible and where they choose to make things. Can invisible. you get, mm, give an example of of how they do or don't do that? Mm-hmm. Um, so in uh, when talking about AI systems, um, uh, what is made invisible is yeah how the decision is made. Mm. Um, so how what wh- how does the algorithm run um, yeah. when a decision is made? Um, what data is used to train that algorithm? Uh, so there are all these uh, questions and all these problems that are surfacing now. Um, like when someone gets a decision in. Uh, say if they get uh, mortgage or not, yeah. they're not given like that explanation, and the person who ran the algorithm cannot give that explanation either because it's designed in such a way where all those all those things are made invisible. Right. Yeah. But but that is a matter of design, but it's also a matter maybe what you mentioned, Martin, of capitalism as well, because the capitalist idea is something that drives our economy in, at the moment now. If you look at who designs technology, who's responsible for several kinds of algor- algorithms that influence our, our lives t- on a daily basis, you can see that those are private companies, mm-hmm. private companies driven by profit. Um, shouldn't, if we talk about a systemic change, shouldn't that change, you know, fundamentally that those algorithms that influ- influences our, our, our lives so, so intensely, that that should be, democra- uh, that, that, that should be democratic? Yeah, it's about like opening, opening up, op- making it open source. Yeah. Um, so that's why uh, a lot of there's a lot of movements on open source technology and making that accessible. Mm. Um, but then I think also to the next level that we need to take further um, is not only just making it open source, but because uh, when when you say open source, it's often code, but then. Mm. You can within code, it still gets messy sometimes. Like as as a developer, I know sometimes you write messy code, and then you're like, "Oh, I'll come back and clean that up later." But you that, never that, do. That doesn't happen all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's also just like um, re-educating people and keeping people's um, uh, knowledge updated there, so they are they have the skill to understand uh, what is happening, even when it is open and accessible. Right? Uh, is it po- is it? F- Foreseeable happen can, can, in the foreseeable future. Can it happen that the Googles and the, the the Facebooks of this world will be more democratic or make it open source? What do you think? I think it is possible. I think it almost happened like a year ago, where everybody stepped out of Facebook. Mm. I thought, okay, maybe a new f- kind of Facebook would emerge and that would be cooperatively owned by everybody on it mm. taking a share. If it's only 100 people on it, you have 100 oh, wow, yeah. shared. If there's a million people on it, you're one millionth shareholder, yeah. where, whether it's on the stock market or not. Then I'm willing to provide my data. The more data I give, yeah. the higher the stock market, and it's in uh, it's your in, hands. I also benefit. Yeah. So a cooperative Facebook could have emerged. Why didn't, didn't it happen? happen? Well, are we lazy? Are we just too lazy? We, and that's the, the thing I mentioned as well with the corona pandemic, uh, COVID pandemic as well. We're too lazy because we, we're not willing to sacrifice the luxurious that we have. I think uh, consumption has made us lame. Mm-hmm. And like, uh, yeah, it's, it has to do with consumerism yeah. that made us uh, just follow the masses and open our mouth and stuff gets fed in. Yeah. Um, and enough criticism and a critical mindset 
needs to be taught yeah. uh, from the early stage, from primary school through academic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Can we use games to do that? We should use games to do that, shouldn't we? We should use a lot of things, including games. But games are no silver bullet. So right. uh, they will not solve issues alone. I think politics and criticality are going to solve many more issues than games alone. Yeah. Somebody way smarter than me said that design is never neutral. Mm -hmm. uh, and we should see this uh, for, for what it is. And I think that we are locked in a kind of uh, cycle in which the things we have... Yeah. Uh, influence uh, the ideology that we that we follow yeah. which influence the thing we design yeah. and this is the cycle that we should be trying to break well not only with games but with many other things but of course games can help <laughs> <laughs> very smart words we've come to the end of this conversation thank you so much for your insights and um well hopefully we'll we can we would this is not the end of the conversation because i think that the democratization of of of, of systems of algorithms and taking more responsibility in the cycle that gabriel described is is very essential in order to have that sustainable but also just city that we uh, that we achieve for um we've come Come to the end of the program and we'd like to finish off with the person who opened uh, the program as well. So I invite Peter van Asse back at the table again for a wrap up because I'm very curious what he uh, uh, what he saw as highlights in his programs. You can join me at the table. I think that's uh, that's uh, that's uh, you're more than welcome to do, do that. Peter, welcome back. Thanks. What was it that stuck out for you in this program today? A lot stuck out. So I'm, I'm really happy to be part of this uh, this fantastic program, and I really enjoyed uh, enjoyed everything, and, and I joined you you also. Um, and and I was really st struck by by the fact that that you that all three of you used imagination as a starting point of uh, changing the world, and then you you sort of take imagination and you make a vision of the future, and you sort of do that very very appealing so you can sort of peek into the future and then you make your as you, as you said ugly objects <laughs> but actually i love them so so they are really nice and then you make them tangible right so people can really interact and 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 even feel and touch them and then martin you you, like, you do things so you use imagination and then do it and, and sort of prove that yes it can happen and have these experiments where you can go all the way and not just to change one thing, no, you change everything. And this is allowed by the fact that this is an experiment. But then, of course, now we have to go into the world and yeah. show what can scale, be done. Scale that up. In, in, in regard to the uh, new European Bauhaus, Bauhaus, are there any ideas that you can apply to that initiative? Absolutely. So, so what you see here is that... And, as it happened in the in the Bauhaus, and we, we should do in the new European Bauhaus. That is that we see is, is not just about about construction. It's not just about digitalization. It's not just about organization. It's not j just about how we make communities. It's not just about waste. It's about all these things. And what Bauhaus is really capable of is enter enter into this new realm where there is a culture of doing things differently on all these aspects that makes a difference so you can we cannot afford we cannot allow a economy to take over of all this because if we if we let economy solve our environmental problems we will be lost mm. it will not happen yeah. because it's not about money it's about changing all these things and this is i think what we learn this yeah. afternoon is to take all these elements, as also Marta showed us, take all these elements and then turn them into a new way of dealing with things. Yes. Well, thank you for that insight. Thank to all our guests for their insights that they shared. And thank you all for, for watching. Uh, we've come to the end of the program. If you have any creative ideas of, or we should, if you would like to work together or if you have projects that you would like to share, please contact the program team and you can do that at hello at uh, Be part of the Kowasi network and help us design towards a sustainable and an inclusive city. We will be back, fortunately, on the 25th of, of October with the next episode. You can check the website as well uh, of the Center of Expertise for Creative Innovation and more information will be supplied there soon. So that's www.coasi.nl. Thanks again for watching. Uh, it's been a blast for me. I'm very inspired and hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.